everyone. A big shout out to Lizzie Edwards this week for tweeting my central line journey was vastly improved by fascinating listening at Podcast EdTech with Dr. Rose Lukin on AI. So Lizzie, I'm glad that you enjoyed that and I believe you're at the British Museum. So glad that you're listening in. This week, before we move on, as part of the EdTech podcast launch party, Drink Sponsors ELT Jam are offering three free half-day workshops to help you improve the experience that you're providing your learners or clients. The ELT Jam team will work with you to prepare an agenda which matches your needs and facilitate an engaging and results-focused workshop. So you can organize these as you wish uh, to get the most out of them, but some examples to get you thinking around those ideas are problem to product. So clarify the problem and work together to find an appropriate solution. Learner experience design. So look at your product through our learner experience lens. And MVP development. So identify your riskiest assumptions and how best to test them. If you're interested, please email joe at eltjam.com to put your name in the hat and for more information on who ELT Jam are, uh, what they do and how they can help, visit www.eltjam.com forward slash welcome. And welcome to the EdTech Podcast. This week we have Dave Faulkner of Australian Outfit Education Changemakers. Dave first became a principal in Australia at 24 and was a district superintendent by the age of 30. At Education Changemakers, he worked on leadership mindset across schools in Australia through conferences, resources and the latest venture, a fast track accelerator for EdTech startups, which is also looking at launching in the UK. Find out why he thinks best practice is too slow, which leadership books he recommends to any team leaders, and why he thinks Victoria, Australia is so well placed as one of the education capitals of the world. I'm Dave Faulkner and this is the EdTech Podcast. Brilliant. So um, I'm sat in King's Cross. It's it's a rainy day, which is a bit of a shame, but um, I have Dave Faulkner here from uh, Education Change Makers in, from Australia, who arrived in the UK yesterday. Uh, so Dave, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so first off, uh, what brings you to the UK this week? Uh, here in the UK, just meeting with lots of different uh, partners and friends that we've made over the last year. Uh, since BET at the start of uh, the year when I was the conference chair. Uh, so meeting with some really cool academy chains uh, as well as lots of education startups uh, from across the UK just to get a sense of the system. Okay, fantastic. And, and what is Education Changemakers for those people that aren't familiar? So Education Changemakers is an organisation that started about five years ago. Uh, and we exist to unleash teacher-led innovation. So we work with uh, high-impact, high-potential education leaders and emerging leaders across the system uh, in Australia and now across the globe to find great teachers and help them do their job better. And uh, we've also branched out from that into uh, working with education startups uh, as well as conference architecture and a whole range of other products that focus specifically on innovation in the education sector. And you used to be a principal, so within the school system in Australia, is that right? I did. I was a principal. I first became a principal when I was 24. So a couple of years into uh, being a teacher, I became the principal of my first small school. Uh, and by the time I was uh, 27, I was running one of the biggest district high schools uh, in the country. And by the time I was 30, I was a district superintendent. I'm not sure what you call that in the UK, but uh, that was uh, a region that was much larger than the size of the UK. Wow, and, and so, you know, what were the factors that led you to such uh, quick sort of career ascendancy? So, you know, how, how come you went through the system that quickly, do you think? Well, I think um, essentially it was putting my hand up early and saying, this is something I want to do, I want to lead change. The guy applied for my first uh, deputy principal's job before I even had a degree. Uh, so that was a little bit interesting. Um, but essentially it was um, putting my hand up to go to places where um, not everybody wanted to go and I was really passionate I grew up in rural areas so really passionate about working in the country areas uh, in Western Australia where I come from uh, and so my first school was about 400 kilometres from the, the capital city of Western Australia in Perth called Marvel Lock uh, and it was from there that I guess doing 
doing what I loved and really proving uh, what I loved to do that uh, I was able to um, continue on in lots of different schools uh, at an early age. Um, we've had a case of the former chair of Ofsted here talking about uh, issues in rurality for education. I mean, what, what did you see as some of those issues and how did you go about tackling them? Because that's something that definitely is people were looking to move towards multi-academy trusts here and there are some issues with those schools that perhaps are really far away from the next school so how did how did you go about tackling some of those problems? Yeah I think well the region that I had as a, as a district director was probably the most uh, geographically sparse region in Australia so the middle of Australia right in the middle in the Northern Territory so we had 22 schools and from one end to the other it was 2,000 kilometres <laughs> so certainly connecting to those as a director you had to drive a lot and fly a lot uh, around to those schools but actually um, the real issue is the isolation for professional isolation and getting people the opportunity to connect uh, through utilising technology uh, and through being able to understand that it's really important to stay connected and to actually utilise what we call at EC the collective genius of other people around you. So if you're in a small school, there's only a few teachers that you are staying connected to the profession and you're getting great ideas and the best way to do that when you are remote or in rural areas is quite often through technology because you can't always drive to the, the nearest school and talk to the next principal. Uh, so it's being able to get on the phone but also get on uh, video chats and uh, utilise technology such as Twitter and Facebook groups and all of those sorts of things and podcasts uh, where you can get your professional growth from and your learning. Are there any particular movements in Australia in terms of you know whether it's Twitter chats or podcasts or resources that you'd like to sort of shout out in terms of you know leading on that education innovation side of things to help connect people? Yeah look there's some uh, amazing stuff I think probably in Australia Twitter is one of the most utilised uh, mediums for teachers. Uh, uh, we have all sorts of uh, chats that work and I mean they're chats that are sometimes global like EdChat, the hashtag uh, EdChat. But we also have uh, lots of things like PST chat, so pre-service teacher chat which is a, an amazing opportunity for young uh, new teachers into the profession to come in. You've got uh, hashtag Aussie Ed, so sometimes... Uh, yeah, we have hashtag Aussie Ed, and uh, Education Changemakers has been utilising for innovative educators. We use hashtag EduChange, okay. and so that's the one that we utilise for our conference, but across the movement, people will hashtag EduChange to actually uh, share ideas with other innovative educators uh, across the country. Um, there's lots of uh, startups that are doing incredible work. There's lots of... Um, not sector specific so much in Australia, so actually EC Labs, uh, which uh, Education Changemakers launched uh, just earlier this year, is the first education sector specific uh, lab uh, and accelerator and incubator in Australia. And can you tell us a little bit more about that then? It seems like a perfect segue into what you're doing at EC Labs and you know what, what's the kind of vision for that project? Yeah, so EC Labs came about because we, uh, since we started out at Education Changemakers, we've always been working with uh, education startups that are looking to innovate and disrupt the market in regards to finding great solutions for student learning. And so we've been working with incredible um, education companies. Our first education company we worked with was Maths Pathways. Maths Pathways is an incredible uh, online technology utilising personalised learning for um, students and enabling that differentiation in the classroom. And working with those guys, we started to look and say what we've actually got uh, at Education Changemakers is an amazing opportunity for education startups to have uh, that... Um, user insight, that deep user insight with lots of users when they're developing their product, when they're testing their product and then when they're growing their product to actually uh, sell it into the market. It gives us that opportunity to really create um, products and programs right from the beginning with startups that really identify the problems, come up with really tangible solutions, test those solutions and when they work help them to scale those solutions. So we've worked with them and, and so we do it a little bit differently to a lot of the other education incubators and accelerators that you might see around the globe. What we actually do is we start with a um, education rapid accelerator. And so what that, is, what that means for us is very different to others. A lot of other uh, accelerators might be a 12 or 14 week program. What we do at Education Changemakers is we harness all of the uh, tech startups, we get them to apply, and then we'll have about 12 to 15 in a room for three days. And we'll go through and we'll really go through their model, pull it apart, we'll have lots of user insights for them, get them to deeply understand their product. And what we're trying to find out in those three days is, do they have a great team uh, with a great idea that is going to impact students in a really powerful and positive way. And so that's our education accelerator model. And from that, uh, we will usually choose if we find um, 
a ed startup that's working really well, we usually choose one or two out of that cohort and that's a, um, we will then incubate them and then that's very different again. Our incubation will go for 12 months, uh, two years, three years. So we work really closely. Once we actually pick up an education startup, we're working deeply with them. So we've got uh, five education startups that have been working with, some for uh, up to four years now, that we're working with deeply to grow and to develop uh, and really build that partnership long term because what we're looking for is is partners and uh, education tech uh, startups that will go to growth, that will have scale and that, that are in it for the long term. And, and what are you finding are some of the trend areas that startups are finding success? I think there's no doubt that uh, STEM uh, is definitely the uh, market that is uh, taking off in Australia particularly. So we actually ran a STEM specific accelerator just recently with PwC. And uh, that is a market that uh, is certainly a focus. Things like knowing that only 17% of the uh, young people are training for 52% of the jobs that are going to exist in STEM is absolutely key. So it's those uh, products like Maths Pathways. Uh, we, we've had a company called Robotics that we've been working with, 3D software printing companies. Uh, these are the sorts of companies that we're seeing there's a real growth area in and that really are focusing uh, on solving that issue of STEM. And actually the one that I'm really excited about in the moment is uh, how do we get more girls into STEM and so those startups I think they're really interesting startups uh, where they're looking at addressing that problem of getting students really interesting we just had actually over at our education change makers conference we took uh, from the BET conference at the start of the year Amy O'Toole and she came over and she presented uh, and she was incredible uh, just giving that idea of uh, how girls are just ordinary girls you don't need to be exceptional it's actually someone just getting girls really passionate and excited about the sciences technology engineering and maths and uh, fostering an environment where they can be really succeed and flourish in that area a quick break in proceedings to bring you news from clearly so our partners again for the edtech podcast launch party clearly so is europe's leading impact investment bank working exclusively with businesses and funds delivering positive social ethical and or environmental impact along with financial return clearly so supports capital raising activity through financial advisory work originally founded in 2008 clearly so has helped more than 100 clients raise more than 100 million pounds in impact investment from its extensive network of high net worth individual and institutional investors. You can follow them at Clearly So and contact John Lloyd, john.lloyd at clearlyso.com for more information. And now you fly all over the world and obviously you just spoke about how you know you've traveled around seen some really interesting projects over the last couple of years. How do you think uh, Australia sort of ranks in terms of education innovation compared to some of those projects that you may have seen? Yeah, it's really interesting. I would actually say I, I'm really fortunate in being able to go and see lots of interesting schools and projects around the world. I would actually rate Australia as one of the top countries for that uh, ability to identify um, the uh, innovation culture that they need. And so we're seeing a huge grassroots movement in Australia um, led by education change makers of those high impact, high potential teachers in the ground, but also outside in the other sectors. So we're getting some really interesting uh, ed tech startups that are coming from our country. Mass Pathways was the first uh, Echoing Green fellow that e has ever come from Australia. Really um, grassroots innovation. So we're seeing a culture where people are embracing it. There's actually our states in Australia are starting to compete for becoming the innovation capitals. So Sydney and Melbourne have currently, you know, really, really fighting over that ed tech space, over the tech space of incubating those things. Yeah, and, and who do you think is winning out? I mean, you're going to be biased slightly. Uh, look, I live in Victoria <laughs> and I'm really excited by uh, some of the stuff that's happening. Uh, Sydney has definitely had more of the edge of, of more of the tech market, right. uh, so more of the startups, but actually Victoria is now known as the education state and that's the the government's agenda and so they've just uh, enabled a thing called Launch Vic uh, and Launch Vic is really focused on those incubators and accelerators to support the ecosystem of startups uh, in Australia and, and I think that uh, Melbourne being such a great place to live and a, a great culture of innovation will actually um, slowly but surely become an, a capital around the world that is going to be seen as a, an incubation and acceleration hub for really cool stuff. So it's always going to be a war between Sydney and Melbourne, but I yeah. think Melbourne will win out in the long term. Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because it just made me think about, you know, in terms of STEM skills that you mentioned and attracting talent. I mean, how does the approach around immigration, you know, does, is that an opportunity? Is it a threat in terms of, you know, are you going to have enough people come and, and sort of fill some of the skills gap as well? I don't know what Australia's 
current uh, outlook on that is? Yeah, look, it's, a, it's, it's certainly a hot topic in Australia, yeah. the immigration topic. And uh, I think the, the places like Melbourne where I live, there's a huge movement to embrace immigration and embrace the skills that we have globally around the world to invite people in and actually say, come on down and let's share our knowledge. And uh, Australia is an incredible place to, to live and we should share that more, I think, uh, in Australia. So we, and I think Melbourne over the last 10 years has been rated either the first or second best city in the world to live in. And I think the more people that can come and live in that, the greater it becomes. And uh, so it's certainly sometimes a challenge with some of the politics that goes on around immigration in Australia. But actually, we would highly embrace those people from around the world to come into uh, our country and actually uh, share their skill sets. Because there's incredible stuff that we see from around the world. We want to harness that. We don't want to just stay localised in Australia. On the back of that point, you know, if we look at sort of education and ed tech in the wider Asian scene including China how do you think things are moving you know what are you hearing with your ear to the ground sort of closer yeah look I think that the Asian uh, ed tech scene and uh, across Southeast Asia where we're seeing there's a huge drive and a huge push uh, for creating really innovative uh, education solutions. And it'll be really interesting to see how that's harnessed from across the world because they sort of sit in the middle uh, and people from Australia, it's, it's, our closest, um, it's our closest sort of area that we go to. So I think there's really interesting stuff that is coming out of there and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of a collaboration between you know, the accelerators and incubators that work in Southeast Asia, in China uh, and Australia because it's actually our most important trade partner that we have. Uh, in Australia. So we are seeing a lot of our ed techs go over and uh, do education tours uh, do with the government to actually look into the market in China specifically. Uh, so we're seeing lots of those things happen from the different states. And there is, it is definitely a growth area and it is if there's an ed tech that's going to be global, I think that there has to be a focus uh, on the Asian market in the long term. So before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about university and, you know, actually looking at the academic side of education excellence and that kind of thing. So could you tell us a little bit more about some of the work you're doing there? Yeah, so we, we work closely with lots of the universities across Australia and we have a great relationship through some of our staff members with uh, places like the University of Melbourne uh, and we've been really fortunate enough to work with Professor John Hattie and other people like that uh, across the country. and. Really, I think that it's really interesting working in the education innovation space because I often say that education change makers is working in the next practice and universities are often working in best practice and evidence-based research models. So I think it's really fantastic to see the embracing of innovation into universities now. They've got incubators starting, they've got these sorts of things happening. And uh, it's really essential, I think, for the innovation sector uh, in education, for people like education change makers to still be driving that next practice, to always be looking at what works best, but actually we have to have that mindset of always getting better. So we're working lots uh, in the industry to say, that's great, we know what works, but what is next practice? What is the next best thing that we are going to be working on? So what's next for EC Labs? Yeah, so we're currently working and looking for uh, partners over here um, in the UK, uh, working closely with, with BET to have a look at what does it actually look like for BET Futures to look at a ra rapid accelerator to actually help those uh, BET Futures startups that are coming in there to identify uh, the things that they need to understand about their product in startup to get really deep user insights. So one of the things that we see most often with EdTech startups, probably the biggest uh, failure that we see where they're failing is that we have this perception because we've all had an education that we understand the education market. And so we are less likely to test our assumptions in the um, as we would with other products to, with the user. So it's actually getting that deep level user insight that we're actually looking for uh, in EC Labs and helping these uh, startups that are uh, going into Bet Futures to really have a strong product when they go to market so that their startup and their growth phase can really uh, accelerate at the potential that it actually has. We talked about you know the tech you perhaps used when you were a principal uh, mm -hmm. and in terms of connecting in those rural areas. But what, what did tech look like when you were actually a student? 
when I was a student. Goodness me. Well, I'm a bit old now. I'm uh, 37. So tech, when I was a, a kid, I can remember the first 286s and 386s uh, that came into my house. And we were, we were pretty lucky to even have them. So there wasn't a lot of technology uh, that was utilised as I went through high school. Uh, we were starting with programming and really basic sort of skills. I can still remember we had typewriting classes uh, and those sorts of things. So learning how to type. Uh, and as I got sort of further into high school, that was when gaming sort of began. Uh, when you started to see the first PlayStations and those sorts of things that that came off, but there wasn't there wasn't a huge amount of technology that was utilised, I guess, until I went to university, which was only in the year two thousand. So that was when technology started to really get utilised, and we started to to learn about it a bit more uh, at university. Uh, but it was obviously that was the growth phase, sort of two thousand to two thousand and ten was the real growth phase for education uh, technologies. And so it was as a teacher and a principal that I really learnt more about how to utilise those things. And how about favourite books? You obviously travel a lot. You're on the plane a lot. Um, yeah. You know, do you have any kind of favourite books that you'd like to add? We have like a an uh, edtech podcast reading list. There's a, there's a few books I love, and they're probably not not edtech specific, but obviously being in the startup world, I love uh, the, the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. I think it's an amazing uh, book, and I think. If you haven't read that book as an education startup, then uh, you need to read it as any startup actually. It's a book that those principles need to be utilised within. Uh, obviously, I love The Edupreneur. It's a book that we wrote, so that's a really good how to, how, to, how to process uh, for educators. I think um, we, we developed that and just launched that this year with Wiley, so that's a, that's a nice read. It's nice to read your own book sometimes. But um, look, there's a whole host of uh, different things that that we would uh, suggest reading. But some of the things that I think is really important that maybe we miss, um, one of my favourite books is Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, uh, the guys that started Zappos in the United States. And why I love that one is it's a book about culture. And I actually think culture eats strategy for breakfast, just like Peter Drucker would say. And I think that that's uh, an important thing for ed startups to get right. You see, when we're looking for ed startups, we're not always looking for the best idea or the best product. What we're looking for is a team with a great culture. And so I would actually say that uh, ed tech startups, any startup needs to focus on building that culture from the very beginning uh, and to understand that and to read books like Delivering Happiness on how do you develop uh, and foster a great culture in your organisation. And if people are listening and they're like, okay, I'm, 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 uh, my ears are open, how do they get in contact with you as well? There's lots of ways they can get in contact. Uh, they can go onto our website, which is www.educationchangemakers.com. The book is at www.edupreneurthebook.com. And uh, on our website, you can get in touch with us. There's email addresses, there's a get in touch form. You can see about EC Labs there. Uh, and anyone can email me at any time. We're a pretty open company, so I am uh, often on my emails talking to people from around the world uh, about ideas, and we're pretty open. We like to share our ideas and share what we have, which is why we wrote the book, to give everybody that opportunity to see the how-to process. Because at Education Changemakers, we're not about the what and the why so much, we're about the how, and that's what startups really need. They get lots of what needs to change and why it needs to change, mm. but actually the most important thing for a startup is how do they go about doing that, both in the education sector and in their business. Just finally, so you're here for how long this week? Uh, I go back home on Saturday and then straight back into uh, more work back in Australia um, over in Sydney and Darwin. And so, you know, what, what is it about the UK that you love and hate? So whilst you're here, what are you thinking, oh, this really sucks, but this is, this is brilliant? Well, this is the first time I've been to the UK uh, in uh, when the weather's been a bit nicer. So the last few times it's been a bit cold. So, but I live in Melbourne, so I can't really complain too much about the weather. There's nothing I really don't like about the UK. I, I really love London. Uh, I really love the people. And I think the thing I love most about it is people's openness to look at these, these different ideas, the meetings that I've been able to set up this week and talk to really interesting companies companies that are doing incredible stuff and not just doing stuff that's incredible uh, in the UK but doing incredible stuff globally so I'm really uh, excited to talk more to people about um, not only what's happening here in the UK but what it is that they're doing to scale their ideas and their impact right across the globe. Thanks very much Dave and have a great week. Thanks Sophie. And finally, in this week's episode, news from welcome sponsors Firefly Learning. So you may know Firefly is an online tool that brings together teachers, students and parents to set homework, track progress, share resources and engage parents. It's used by hundreds of schools worldwide, including Hyams Park School, Hammersmith Academy and the British International School of Cairo. 
Eight of the top 10 UK independent schools use Firefly. And you can follow the team at Firefly Team and contact Alex McMillan, alex at fireflysolutions.co.uk with any inquiries. So thanks to all of those guys. To follow Education Changemakers on Twitter, you can do so at Edu Changemakers to let Dave know your thoughts on this episode. And don't also forget that you can subscribe to the EdTech Podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Cast. And I'm looking to come to bring the EdTech Podcast to the Web Summit. So if you're attending Web Summit and you're one of the EdTech community out in Lisbon or visiting, then do get in contact at Podcast EdTech and I'll let you know uh, our plans. Have a great week. Bye.